Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlawn Next and based in Egan. Through Westlawn Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Welcome to Access to Democracy. Uh, Alan Miller back with you and uh, we have a return guest, although he tells me it's been three, four years since you've Correct. been here. Scott Pohl, champion bowler and proprietor of On Track Bowling in Cedarville Lanes here in Egan. Welcome back. Thank you. And uh, what age did you start bowling? I started my first bowling league in, uh, I was 13 years old, a little over 30 years ago. You're 43 now? 45. What does that make me? Well, a little older. Yeah. <laughs> Scott's had a really interesting bowling career. He's been uh, four times on Team USA. Mm -hmm. well, you went pretty much around the world with that, didn't you? That's correct. I was able to travel uh, overseas, which was <laughs> unbelievable. I always was a fan of the Olympics, and I wanted to be in the Olympics. In bowling, they only have world championships. So I, I tried out for Team USA. I got to travel to Santa Domingo for the Pan American Games. Uh, I got to travel to Malaysia for the World Championships, Kuala Lumpur. And then also I got to go to Pusan, South Korea for the World Championships. And the teams won. Yes, we won gold medal in <coughs> uh, the Pan American Games. And we also won the gold medal in South Korea. First team in 35 years to win the gold medal, which was very special for the USA since it took a long time. And then we also won the silver medal in Malaysia. Now, you're the proprietor of a bowling establishment, but you're also a professional bowler. Part-time professional, yes. So, but you're a member of the PBA. No, I'm not. You're not. As bowler, I thought you were. As a bowler, you can actually earn income <laughs> as an amateur. It's kind of a unique thing in golf. You can't do that or other sports. Uh, for somehow the USBC or um, they just founded it to where you can earn money. Now, what's your average? My league average is going to be about 235 to 240 at your typical bowling center, uh, like Cedar Valley Lanes, their house shot that you'll see out there most of the time. And the competitions? Competitions, I'm pleased, typically around the 220, 220 average. Now, why is there a difference between say a local alley and the competitions. Is it the oil pattern? It's the oil pattern. The best way I can equate it is a lot like golf courses. You'll see a US Open golf course pattern, you know, play differently as far as the course goes versus your down the road golf course. It's the same thing in bowling. They make it much more challenging. Now, this is the most popular family sport in the world. <clears throat> and every place we've been there have been bowling alleys in Europe, in Mexico, every place else. And yet, and I once wrote an article uh, about it, which actually won first place in a bowling awesome. uh, magazine competition, uh, about the fact that bowling is not an Olympic sport. And we have some really weird Olympic sports today. Mm -hmm. But why isn't bowling? There's a few different reasons. Number one, it, just, <coughs> it doesn't generate revenue uh, per se, a bowling uh, compared to baseball. You're not going to have thousands of people in the stands watching bowling. It's not going to create a lot of revenue. Uh, in a bowling center, what do you think? You can get a few hundred people comfortably, and you can't charge a high dollar amount. Why couldn't they put the, as they do, move these stadiums, uh, move these lanes around week to week on the television competition? Why couldn't they put them in a stadium? Uh, the viewing. The viewing is just not very good for bowling if you're a long ways away. 
Uh, people are used to being close to the action. You can only have so many seats. They've had it in stadium settings or in uh, kind of like theater settings. It's been done. Um, another reason that it's not in the Olympics, it's played, it has to be played in the summer, which uh, the reason is uh, in order to be a winter sport, you have to be played on snow or ice. In summertime, it's very tough to get a sport in the Olympics. How about bowling on ice? Bowling on ice. Hey, I'd be up uh, for it. Let's do it. We haven't done that. Yeah, you know, let's do that. We have, I mean, the luge, which in the article uh, that I wrote uh, that won the uh, competition, uh, I described it as people going downhill on cafeteria trays. Well, it, it's a little bit more sophisticated than sure. that, but the fact of the matter is it's not much more than that. True. And we've had some really weird sports that have cropped up in the Olympics. <clears throat> well, if you look at Summer Olympics, those are pretty constant. There's not and a lot of... Track and field and things like that. Yes, a lot yeah. of constant coliseum-type <clears throat> settings with high revenue volumes. Thousands of people can go see it. Only one time was the uh, bowling in the Olympics. It was an exhibition sport in 1988, and that's the only time. And and yet there are some really great bowlers out there, some Absolutely. great professional bowlers. Absolutely. And uh, it's also gotten bigger on TV in the last couple of years. Yes, ESPN, mm -hmm. um, you know, is doing what they can. Um, I'm not a big fan of them trying to compete against the NFL. And when their telecasts are going on, I don't really believe that helps them. No, I don't think it does no. either. But so uh, that's just an economics issue for what they can afford. But on a Sunday at noontime or something like that, uh, and they actually, they could have bowling in the evenings for that sure. matter. absolutely. There's nothing that would stop them from having bowling mm -hmm. uh, in the evenings. Mm -hmm. but, uh, that, that's pretty much gone with uh, who's been in charge of the PBA. Uh, they've kind of failed in a few efforts to get the sponsors to be at the proper times for the viewers. Um, now you have to find bowling on TV. You know, if you look back to when I used to watch it on Saturday afternoons with Chris Schenkel and Bo Burton, we didn't have to find it. We knew where it was. It was right before uh, Al Michaels and the Wide World of Sports. Now and we have uh, to find it. Yeah, which it could be on a Sunday, it could be on a Saturday. It could be at uh, 2 o'clock, it could be at 12 o'clock, uh, that's true. Right. The best way to find it now is just through social media. And uh, that's a thought. So let's talk about some of the awards that you have won. Okay. Uh, bowling. Oh, um, well, we There's mentioned a couple. More than I can put on my sheet here. <laughs> okay. We mentioned a couple. Uh, my finest uh, as a team, uh, we won that world championship. Uh, for the United States team, which was 35 years in the making, which is hard to believe with all the great bowlers through the United States. They never won a team world championship. Um, uh, I would say another one that goes down there for individual. Uh, individual was I won uh, a very prestigious amateur event. Um, the best amateurs in the world bowl this one uh, called the High Roller Tournament in uh, Las Vegas. That was 2012. And then also one that kind of goes along with it. The way even I can, though, even though they're amateurs, though they can earn money. Correct. The way I can equate it is there is about three or four major events, kind of like in golf. You have the Masters, the British Open, you have the PGA. So the other major event is the Mini Eliminator. And the last time we did our show at Cedarville Lanes, I had that trophy there. So that's kind of the big second one. Um, so those are a couple of big individual accomplishments. And, yeah, you have some of those trophies on display in the pro shop, correct. as a matter of fact. Correct, correct. And the medals as well. I, I keep my medals there for customers who are interested in showing that I can at least beat you every once in a while. You can beat me any time. Well, about I don't know. You'd probably beat me left-handed. What, uh, left-handed? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, the way I'm bowling these days. We'll have to uh, challenge that, maybe. You know, we, we, as we were putting up the computer graphics there, I said you're very successful as an instructor, except with me. Well, I look at it as the masses. You know, if I have a high success rate, that's, that's where I'm at. It's kind of like a doctor. I don't understand. If I could go from a 221 mm -hmm. to, well, that was an exceptional day because uh, my lowest game was a 170 that day. Mm -hmm. But then I come back, and I'm bowling 140 average, 146 average now. Uh, I could tell you why. Well? Well, it's pretty simple. How often do you uh, get out on the lanes and do that? Monday nights. There you go. <laughs> Once a week. 
If I did it once a week, I would not be very successful. But uh, reading oil patterns mm -hmm. is very important because mm -hmm. the lanes put down different oil patterns. Uh, I have never been able to read an oil pattern. I don't know how you read an oil pattern. Okay. How do you get yourself to... Uh, what you're looking for is um, you have to know uh, from the foul line to where the head pin is, the front pin, is 60 feet. Okay. Now your typical house condition will be 40 feet, let's say two-thirds of the lane. And then of course that's on the back end part of the lane, the people that throw the rotation and spin on the ball, some people like to call it, that's when it will hook. Uh, what you have to look at is the distance of the oil pattern first. If it's a longer oil pattern, let's say 48 feet, well, it doesn't have as much time to hook, right? So the ball will not hook as much. Typically, you need to play a straighter shot. Now, if you have a shorter oil pattern, let's say 30, 35 feet, you have to plan for a much bigger hook. So play for that type of thing. That's one characteristic. Then there's a characteristic also of how much amount of oil. And you can find all that now on the internet, actually, of course, like everything. Can you? Oh, sure. How to read an oil <coughs> pattern. And uh, there's articles on it. And uh, absolutely. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I never thought to look. At it's the, really become a science now. Um, actually, for every uh, event that I go to, we try to find the oil pattern. And we try to simulate that oil pattern. We put it in the machine at Cedarvale and practice on it. Is that right? Yeah. It's, uh, and the different patterns have different names, right? Absolutely. The World 10 Pin Bowling Association came out with uh, <laughs> patterns after cities. So for instance, they have Paris and Sydney and uh, Montreal and Atlanta and Los Angeles and things like that. That's their characteristic. And some of the other ones that you hear on uh, Sunday bowling with yes. the pros? are the animal patterns. You'll hear uh, chameleon, cheetah, viper, shark, things like that. And that's strictly the thickness of the oil Correct. and or the length and the length and of course uh, to make it more challenging is you know will the ball guide itself to the pocket where you want it to go and that's typically a pattern where it has more oil in the center drier outsides well of course the more challenging the pattern the more flat you know kind of going back to that golf course analogy much tougher to get it near the hole but at the same time the ball and the way the ball is drilled is very important. I know that, and uh, we certainly have gone over it. Mm -hmm. uh, first, talk about the construction of the ball. There is okay. a weight in the center of the ball. Yes. Um, most importantly <laughs> with a bowling ball is the surface of the ball, uh, because that's what's going to make the ball grab when it starts to hook or how it makes contact. That's making the footprint on the lane. That's the most important thing. And then, like you mentioned, the weight block on the inside of the ball creates when it starts hooking and how much it will potentially hook. But if you drill the same ball differently several times, it's going to react differently on the lanes. Absolutely. So you really have to find where that ball hooks, Yep. Wh what its hook ratio is, yes. as opposed to the person who's throwing it, and then you have to drill for that. Mm -hmm. uh, my process is uh, luckily, the manufacturers are very good to me about sending product a little early before it actually comes out. So I will drill one up for myself and compare it to others in that product line. And then that way I know the characteristics. So let's say a, a customer comes in, is interested, I need to watch that person throw a few shots and figure out how to match that up to their style. And once you do that, you sort of have a handle on that ball. How many manufacturers are there that are making bowling balls It's a balls very today? good question. Um, <coughs> I want to say eight or nine. I haven't added it up. Um, I would actually say there's uh, about seven or eight major manufacturers. Brunswick has always been in the forefront. Correct. There's Brunswick, Storm, Rotogrip, Columbia, Track. Did I say Ebonite? Um, and then, of course, there's a 900 Global and there's a few others. Those are the major. I think the ball that I'm throwing now is a storm. Yes. And the weight also. I used to throw a 16 pound ball. Uh, this one I think is what, 15? Could be 14. It might be 14. I think it's 14. <clears throat> and I also have what we call a spare ball, which mm -hmm. is supposedly a straight ball. Mm -hmm. Now I've been throwing that the last three weeks and it would get, when it gets down near the pins it's hooking away from them. Is that because of the person that's throwing it? A little bit, a little bit, and maybe the ball <laughs> is starting to wear in, and that will also cause more, cause more friction on the lane, 
and friction creates to hook. That's where the ball creates that friction in the dry part of the lane. As we were talking before we went on, and we were talking about the fact that I am missing spares regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had my share of strikes lately, but my spares are missing by an inch. It doesn't make any difference. It could be a foot and a half. Uh, sure. If you miss, you miss. And if you're using that ball that you're trying to throw straighter with, mm -hmm. uh, it's a good idea to come in and have that fixed. You know, if you're just missing it by that little bit, that's all it takes is just fine-tuning your equipment sometimes. Now, when we talk about the equipment, and we should talk about the equipment, so we have eight manufacturers, roughly, that are making these bowling balls, and they make them in all weights from, what, 9 to 16 pounds? 6 through 16. 6 through 16. <clears throat> does it make any difference how much your ball weighs? It does. As opposed to how many pins you knock down? It does. Um, the right speed is very crucial. Uh, for instance, let's say if you could throw a 16-pound ball, um, but you throw it very slow. Uh, you throw it, say, 10 miles an hour. That's not going to be very effective. By the time it hits the pins, it's going to lose all of its energy. And it's not going to go through the pins the proper way, and you're going to leave a lot of pins. So, for instance, you're better off throwing a 14-pound ball, maybe 13 to 15 miles an hour, a little more optimal speed. It's going to go through the pins better. But it's not just the bowling ball that makes a difference. There is other equipment that the bowler should have. And let's talk about the price of bowling balls sure. uh, for starters. Okay. Uh, they can run into uh, some substantial yes. amounts these days. Correct. Right? Um, starting out, uh, you're just your most basic bowling ball like you'll find on the rack out there, uh, the house balls. Uh, they're going to start at about $70. Um, and then once you want to get into a little performance ball, at a minimum, you want to be probably around $120 to $150. And then when your skill level improves, you can get all the way up to 250. I have an expensive ball. My skill level has not improved. Actually, if you look at it, I didn't charge you a very expensive ball. Pardon? Your ball isn't very expensive. No? No. So I didn't realize that. Well, no. I'm trying to get you above that moderate skill level. Well, let's go. Okay. Let's go. I'd love to sell you a more expensive ball. But it's not just the ball that's important. Uh, there's also equipment that you have to have. Correct. Number one, you have to have bowling shoes. That's exactly right. Uh, Very important. <coughs> um, I find a lot of people who are actually pretty good skill level players um, have very inexpensive or generic shoes. And that is very overlooked uh, just for the fact of your foundation of to throw the ball is your feet. Uh, the disadvantages of the low price shoe, for example, is inconsistencies. Um, you know, it just won't give you the consistent traction time and time again. Now, I see a lot of bowlers who put a sock over their shoe. What does that do? It typically gives it a slicker uh, result if they have a problem sticking, and it's typically from your inexpensive generic shoe, uh, the low price shoe, entry level shoe. Uh, they typically wear out a little faster, so that sock will give them the needed, you know, glide or skid on the approach they need. Now, Sharon and I were just talking, and we realized that the shoes that I am bowling with, uh, even though my shoe, sh shoe size has changed, uh, are probably 25 to 30 years old. Okay. They look good. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have never worn out. But I know uh, that uh, I'm going to have to get new shoes. I would recommend it. Um, they definitely wear out. Uh, of course, they're broken into you know what you're used to, uh, but that's that's phenomenal lifespan of pair of shoes. That's very good. And it's, of course, I bowl once a week, so that's that probably uh, that's still above the average. <coughs> if you buy a very good performance pair of shoes, uh, I think you get 10 to 15 years out of them these days. Other equipment. Other equipment uh, is a lot of uh, supports, you know, wrist supports. Uh, consistency for the wrist, uh, especially in bowlers that need a little bit of help with their wrist staying stable or weaker wrists. Um, I find that a lot with ladies, um, just because of the fact they're not as you know strongly structured in their wrists. Kids, um, you know, uh, getting up there in age certainly doesn't help. We get problems with our wrists. Uh, myself, uh, I'm 45. I use a slight wrist guard uh, just because I need it. I do also, and of course I had tendonitis in, in my throwing arm, so I have a support mm -hmm. that 
tightens around the muscle up here also. Absolutely, and there's it, uh, you see a lot now um, of the bowlers and athletes in general. Um, I just started a few years ago. I saw a lot of basketball players using the sleeves on their arms. I they see call, that. Now. They call yeah. it the shooter sleeves. And uh, actually, um, a lot of bowlers, myself included, use that sleeve. It's an arm compression. So it just gives the arm uh, more support, so less fatigue. With the sport being as popular as it is, with people having birthday parties there, with midnight bowling, with all sorts of new innovations in the sport, yet alleys are disappearing. There are becoming a lot less places to bowl. And just looking around here, I mentioned Burnsville, which had, I think, 32 lanes, and that's gone. Uh, Cedarvale has 32 and is, always seems to be busy, but also we've had some other local uh, bowling alleys close. Uh, is that because it's too expensive to maintain them? What is it? Um, a lot of it comes down to is just, um, in my opinion, uh, treating the consumer the right way, the proper way. Uh, sometimes you have to spend a little bit to get a little bit. And a lot of the bowling centers, uh, they were trying to just get by as bottom of the barrel as possible. Uh, so that comes out to customer service not being very good, cleanliness, um, and the overall experience for the bowler just, you know, declines. And Cedarvale bends over backwards to make those things more attractive. They really do. Plus, they have a really nice restaurant there. Well, in case in point, it was voted the best bowling center in the Twin Cities this past fall from a WCCO poll. Um, so it kind of stands for itself. But they do an excellent job with the things I just mentioned and the fact that all the people involved in bowling are bowlers, successful, competitive bowlers. So they understand if you have a complaint or if you have a comment, they understand where you're coming from. And that makes a big difference. It now does. You, you just, uh, I think, finished very high in a national competition. Yes. Uh, what was that? It is the USBC Masters. Uh, the way I, I, another <laughs> golf analogy, I guess, people understand is uh, the PGA Championship, you can qualify from your sectionals. You can be a local head pro, let's say, and qualify. Uh, so this was the bowling USBC Masters, where you have your typical touring players that do it full time, and then you have your head professionals, or like myself, I'm an amateur, but I'm in the pro shop business, go out and play. There's 440 um, bowlers, and uh, I finished uh, 33rd. So you finished well into the top 10 percent. Top 10 percent, correct. <clears throat> and where was that tournament? It was in New Jersey, uh, North Brunswick, New Jersey. So to compete in that, is there an entry fee? There is. Uh, it's $450. You can also win an entry uh, through certain events to get there. And you also have to worry about your airfare. Airfare. And lodging. Lodging. And food. Food. So. What rental car. Rental car. So what does it cost you to go to a, an event like uh, that? I believe the whole week uh, for me was around $1,500. So you're, you're behind the eight ball to start means you better win some money. I better. And, and did you? I did. Uh, my, uh, my check uh, and prize winnings was worth $2,500. Okay, so you made $1,000 for what, I did. a four day? Uh, I made 1000 and I think my wife got 900 of it. <laughs> Or so she'd like to think. Well, anyway, but uh, uh, bowling uh, per game, expensive. It's, it used to be, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I started at 12 years old setting pins in an alley after school. <clears throat> in those days, I, I think bowling was a half a dollar or something like that. And we would set pins for free, mm -hmm. uh, waiting for tips. People would throw a dime or a quarter down there. Mm -hmm. Uh, assuming you were unscathed <laughs> because you had to step down on a lever, the, the pins came up, uh -huh. uh, you had to set the pins, and many times you would get hit by flying pins. So uh, it was a whole different world. Of course, we didn't have automatic scorekeepers mm -hmm. in the, those days either. Mm -hmm. uh, but bowling was not expensive. In, now, general, today, in general, now, today, it's still very affordable uh, for a family uh, to, you know, take your family out and do something like that compared to other events. Still very affordable. Well, certainly to go to a baseball game or a basketball game and get a good seat, you can pay $60 here in the Twin Cities. Correct. Easily. 
I, I mean, just for instance, I think at Target Field, the lowest price ticket is fifteen to twenty dollars. Yeah, yeah, and that's not including parking and uh, you know refreshments and whatnot. Now, of course, you have free parking at uh, Cedar Vale. This most is true. Most lanes do have Absolutely. free parking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. so, what can we do to get more people bowling and to get some new alleys built? New alleys built. Um, I guess, in my opinion, it starts a lot with youth. It really does. Um, somehow get the youth back involved more, which uh, is happening. Uh, I remember when I was that age, uh, it was what I wanted to do when I got home from school. You know, uh, I wanted to go play. I wanted to go bowl. Uh, we live in Minnesota. I can't go out and play golf six months out of the year, let alone eight months. Um, try to get the youth involved somehow. Uh, youth are available to anything. Are there youth programs in the schools? Yes, that is the positive thing of bowling right now. High school programs are very, very good. And uh, collegiate, sorry, collegiate programs are very good as well. Yeah, I know that there's a lot of collegiate uh, competition. Mm -hmm. And there are certain schools that actually give bowling scholarships. Correct. Yeah. Numerous schools. Um, and ladies, they have uh, Division I scholarships. Um, so, and you don't have to be an extremely high level bowler to be there. Um, they're just looking for, you know, scholastics uh, to be a pretty good bowler. And uh, high school bowling, um, I would say in the last three, four years, has increased by about 40%. Um, lots. Well, that, that's looking up to the future. That is. And uh, the average game today costs how much? I think if you walk into a bowling center, $3. So... Uh, Probably just to get you to break in a game or two and learn the sport. Mm -hmm. You give lessons. Absolutely. You've been very successful. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that, except for me. But uh, You're not uh, a complete failure. I'm almost a complete no. failure. It's a, no. it's a you keep trying. That's, that's a good <coughs> thing. I keep trying. Yes. Uh, so a for effort, D for uh, scores. I'd like to see you in there more than once a week. It's hard to find the time to do it more than once a week, but uh, I understand. But it's a great sport. I have enjoyed it all my life, and it's, uh, it, it's one of the few sports um, uh, you can play until you're 80 years old. Um, there was an article in the paper the other day: a 80-year-old look at me person had a 300 game, and you know he wasn't a great high-level bowler or anything. He had a 300 game. Just the other day, there was a 10-year-old. Had a 300 beam. I'm still waiting for my first 300. Although I've had a couple of 200s this year, I've also had a couple of 118s, 128s, 140s, mm -hmm. and so on. And one last note, I mean, there's a lot of competition once you turn over 50 these days. Uh, we've been talking with Scott Paul from Cedarvale Lanes. There was a lot more I wanted to talk about. And maybe we'll have Scott back with some bowling balls and we'll talk about some techniques and things like that. Scott, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks.